as a pretty new D&D player, I never quite got the appeal of mega dungeons, hex scrolls, or random encounters in general. When you tell me a game's content is procedurally generated, my mind doesn't exactly go to, wow, how exciting. Often, it feels to me like games with procedural generations are sacrificing quality in favour of quantity, because quantity makes for better clickbait. Given the chance, I would always spend my limited time and energy to prepare 5 interesting encounters over 200 dull ones. By the time I finish running those 5 interesting encounters, the session is over, and I have an entire week to prepare the next 5 ones anyway. But I'm a game design nerd, so when a lot of people tell me that something is cool and I don't get it, it makes me want to investigate. So I did what any self-respecting mad scientist would do, I ran a couple mega dungeons, against my best judgement. I wanted to see if it was possible to have both quality and quantity. And as it turns out, you can. You just need better designed random tables. So let's talk about what that could look like. And I'm going to get into that in just a second, but before that, there's another way you can get both quality and quantity, and it's with Fernbloom's Guide to Freebone Vale, which is this channel's first ever sponsor. The book, which you can find on Kickstarter right now, is a mini setting depicting a small region which you can drop into any D&D campaign, even an ongoing one. The region, Freebone Vale, is a valley isolated from the rest of the world, on one side by a tall mountain range, and on the other by the mysterious spirit lands. The book has a ton of actionable material like adventure seeds for each location in the book, travel encounters with actual story to them, and a starter adventure. So if you want to support this channel and its first ever sponsor, you can find the link in the description. Ok, on with the video. Earlier this year, the creator of the Mothership tabletop RPG started a trendy challenge on Twitter, Dungeon23. The idea was simple, create a mega dungeon by creating one room a day for an entire year. A lot of people took on that challenge, but even though there's a few troopers who are still doing it to this day, most people eventually burned out and gave up. If we're going to shoot for both quality and quantity, the first thing we need to do is talk about how creativity works in the first place because every technique I'm going to talk about in this video is going to be based on this one principle. There is a famous quote by Mark Rosewater, the lead game designer for Magic the Gathering. In other words, someone whose entire career is to come up with about a thousand new cards per year and somehow make them not boring. In his talk, 20 Years 20 Lessons Learned, Mark sums up his creative process like this. Restrictions breed creativity. Let's do a quick exercise to show how it works. Come up with a cool encounter. Right now. I'll give you 10 seconds. And it has to be something new, you can't just use an encounter you've already come up with before. No? Got nothing? Don't worry, that doesn't mean you lack creativity. It just means in this exercise, your creativity is not being seeded properly. The starting point is one that doesn't let itself to reaching an interesting destination. So now let's do a second exercise. Come up with a cool encounter, but that encounter has to involve three things. One, a spatula. Two, a shark and three, an incredibly handsome flying eyeball construct who you are definitely subscribed to. I've added restrictions, but right now your brain is probably being flooded by encounter ideas. You're wondering how the shark and the modron and the spatula might fit together in a way that makes sense, a bit like you're trying to solve a puzzle. Is the modron maybe defending itself from the shark by fighting it off with a spatula? Is there a shark riding modron who is on a quest to find and destroy the unholy spatula of chaos? This is how you hack your brain into being more creative. By restricting the field of possibilities, you avoid choice paralysis and avoid falling back into your comfort zone. And thanks to that, you can more quickly hone in on a new, innovative idea one that you will actually like. So let's take a look at one of the random encounter tables from Curse of Strahd, which is probably the most popular sandbox style adventure for 5e, for an example of how random tables are usually handled in D&D. Let's say your players are traveling from the village of Barovia to the town of Velaki. According to the book, first you need to roll a d20 every 30 minutes of travel to figure out whether or not you will even get a random encounter at all. So you pull out a ruler, do a bunch of math and figure out it will take your players about 6 hours to make the trip, so you need to roll 12 d20s. Then, if your adventurers are traveling by day, you get an encounter on an 18 or above, and if they are traveling by night, you get an encounter on a 15 or above. There's 12 encounters which are shared between the day and night, and 7 encounters you can 
only have during the day and seven you can only have during the night. So over 12 rolls, that's two encounters on average if you're traveling by day or four encounters if you're traveling by night. And since you're traveling somewhere, usually to do some adventuring, you might have an extra encounter or two once you reach that new location. This type of setup is pretty common. The number of encounters you get is tied to how much time you spend in the area, which helps portray this area as dangerous because it makes it so your players can't just take a rest after every single encounter. Another common version of this is to have some kind of a counter which you increment over time and when it reaches a certain value, you go However, I don't know about you, but I can definitely think of a few ways you could achieve that same result without having to roll 12 d20s or having to pull out a ruler and do a bunch of math. That's just a whole lot of work for not a whole lot of gameplay. For example, you could literally just say roll two encounters whenever the players travel between two locations. And if you really want the number of encounters to be random, you can either add a result to the table which says no encounter, or my favorite solution, you can just add more non-combat encounters. Considering the fact I can't make more than two videos without mentioning the Fallout franchise, you know I'm into that sort of environmental storytelling. But that resolution mechanic isn't the only thing we can look at with a critical eye. For example, I mentioned that the book gives us one table for day encounters and one table for night encounters. But that is not necessarily the only way we could have divided those tables. Take a look at this map, courtesy of Dragna Carta on Reddit. It shows the different regions of Barovia. Each of these is a slightly different biome. You've got mountains, swamps, forests, and plains, and each of them is home to usually just one or two important locations, each with their associated plot hooks, baddies, and dedicated section within the book. So our one random table needs to work regardless of which region the encounter actually takes place in. Now, personally, I like to think about it this way. Travel encounters are usually the first impression your players are going to get about whichever location they are traveling to. So that makes these travel encounters the perfect place to introduce some plot hooks, do some foreshadowing or drop some lore. But if we only have this one random encounter table for the whole campaign, we can't do that. This means from how the random tables are organized and presented, we're already setting ourselves up to only ever have random encounters which cannot tie into the plot of the adventure, or at least the plot of the region that you're currently exploring. To avoid that kind of missed opportunity, what we could do is have one table for each of those eight regions, instead of one for the entire campaign. You're typically only visiting each area once, except for the settlements, so each of these eight random tables can be much smaller. But now we can fill our tables with much more interesting encounters. If we do this for each of the eight regions, we'll have to come up with almost twice as many encounters as if we only had one table for all of Barovia. But the regions act as extra restrictions, which means we've made it easier to come up with these 50 interesting encounters than those 25 boring ones. But let's take a look at the table itself now. To figure out which encounter you get, you roll 1d12 plus 1d8, which is basically saying we wanted to have 20-ish entries, but wanted to skew the results towards the middle of the table. In fact, instead of that, you could just roll a d100, and with these numbers, you would get functionally the exact same table, except this D100 table is much easier to tweak than that D12 plus D8 table. Say you want wolves a bit more than dire wolves. You remove three here, you add three there, and boom, you're done. So that's already one small improvement we can make. Just give ourselves better control over our table. But here's a question. Why would we want some encounters to be eight times more frequent than others to begin with? Your first instinct might be to go, this encounter should be more rare than that one, because Barovia has more wolves than revenants. Otherwise, it's not going to be realistic, right? But you already have 3d6 wolves in that encounter and one revenant in that one. So that's already communicating that there's a lot more wolves. Do you really need the encounter itself to be less frequent? Because what this is doing is that by the time you get that rare encounter once, you'll have fought, on average, 14 packs of wolves and your players will probably be bored before that happens. So if your rare encounter is an interesting one, and your common encounter is, let's call it, less interesting, then by doing this, you're making it so your random encounters will be less interesting overall. Is that really something we want to do? So that's not the reason. Now, another possible reason to have less frequent encounters is that one of your encounters only makes sense if you get it once. In this case, we have a Revenant who tells the players they can get some help in their fight against Strad if they go to 
Argin Vosholt. If the entire purpose of this encounter is to be a plot hook, then there's really no sense in introducing that same plot hook a second time. So by putting it at the end of the table, we're making it less likely to roll it more than once. In fact, you would normally need to travel between the villages of Borovia and Velaki an average of 50 times to get that encounter once. And that means by the time this happens, your players will probably have finished the entire adventure without ever having heard of So let's think about another way we could avoid having repeat encounters without having our most interesting encounters be so unlikely our players will basically never see them. One easy way to do this, for each encounter, you write what happens if you get this result multiple times. The revenant who told you about Arjin Vostolti. You see him being attacked by a mob of angry villagers who don't know he's actually a good guy. The next time after that, you find him in ghost form after losing his old body to a battle with Strad. So now he needs your help to find a new body. By building upon past encounters in this way, not only are we now okay with rolling the same result twice, but now it's actually great if we do. Our players are familiar with this revenant guy, so a second encounter with him will only deepen their bond. You can use the first encounter to do some foreshadowing and have it pay off in the next one. And it's going to be very easy to come up with that follow-up encounters because, you guessed it, the first encounter acts as a restriction. It's extra context. You're not just coming up with an encounter anymore. You're either coming up with the first encounter of this new series or the follow-up to the last encounter. Now let's actually roll that d12 plus d8. We get a 13, and that means 1d6 direwolf. Now, that might sound a bit bare bones, but don't worry. The encounter table is followed by a bunch of encounter descriptions. So let's go read the details. And what we get is they just attack. In fact, if you read through this entire table, out of 26 encounter, almost a third of them basically boil down to monsters show up and attack with nothing more to them. Honestly, having to run or play through these encounters is probably the scariest part of Curse of Strat to me. Now, part of that is because they had to come up with encounters which would work regardless of where they happen, and we've already solved that by having a bunch of smaller tables for each region. But another part of that is there's actually two types of random tables. There's random encounter tables, like this one, where each entry has a couple paragraphs of story to them, and then there's what I like to call random prompt tables, which are designed to kickstart your creativity by giving you restrictions. With that second type of table, you're the one coming up with the encounter. The table is just here to get you started on the right foot. There's no paragraphs of details further down, it's just the nerd equivalent of a mood board. But because I had to come up with that name of random prompt table, that tells me there's a lot of people, including D&D's designers apparently, who don't really mark the difference between those two types of tables. And so we end up with encounter tables that have prompts in them. And if you're presenting a prompt as an encounter, it's going to look like an extremely boring encounter, like those in Curse of Strad. So let's talk a bit about prompt tables and how to use them properly. Like we did in that creativity exercise earlier, a common way to use prompt tables is to roll more than one prompt. More restrictions, more good. One way to do this is to roll twice on the same table, and then you have to decide what the relationship between your two results are. For example, let's say you get Barovian villagers and werewolves. You could decide that the villagers are being attacked by a werewolf, or maybe that one of them has turned into a werewolf and the rest of the village is hunting it. Another way to do this is to have multiple prompt tables, where each of them handles a different aspect of the encounter. For example, maybe you have one table of monsters and then one table of locations. You roll on each of them and now you have a monster in a location. And just by having these two tables with six entries each, by using the marvelous power of multiplications, we've created 36 possible combinations. You just need to have enough tables to cover every aspect of an encounter that you care about. So if all you care about is having monsters, you should probably have a table of monsters. But if, like me and many others, you want your encounters to have some amount of story to them, Maybe you can add a prompt table for encounter objectives or encounter rewards with stuff like rescue a hostage, find a clue, sneak past the enemies, etc. You can roll these prompts ahead of time while you're preparing your next session, basically just using them as a tool to help you put yourself in a creative mood. Or you could use them during your session and improvise encounters on the fly. This might sound difficult if you haven't done it a lot, but I like to think about it this way. It's only while you're in the moment that you can know 
how the pacing of your session is going. There's no better time to decide whether what your session needs is a combat encounter or something else. Say you roll a wolf, for example, but you can see that your players are a bit tired of combat and you only have half an hour left in your session. Because you can read the room, you can make it a non-combat encounter about healing a wounded wolf instead of a combat encounter about fighting a pack of wolves. And that's something that's only possible if you use a prompt during your session rather than during your prep. So now, let's apply these techniques and create a mega dungeon. This is Thass, a city which was swallowed by the sea after an earthquake basically folded the city onto itself. The players are looking for the city's bank, and more precisely its vault, which contains some MacGuffin they're looking for. We have a theme and we have an objective. Let's build this thing. First, we're going to divide the city into five biomes. For each of these biomes, we're only going to actually prepare one room. This is where the plot happens, where we introduce complications, factions, and all of that cool stuff which gives the Mega Dungeon its identity. Everything in between is going to be random prompt tables, which tie into that one scene we actually prepared. So, for each biome we're going to have two tables, one for creatures and one for locations. The first area is going to have one extra table of secrets to learn about because it needs to do exposition about the rest of the dungeon. And we're going to add one last table for encounter types, just so we can ensure we have some variety and not everything is a combat encounter. That's the entire process, really. It took me about four hours to put this dungeon together and my players spent six sessions in it. By empowering them with a ton of information about the different factions operating within the dungeon, my players were able to take the narrative in directions I could never have expected and this created emergent gameplay moments that we still remember a couple years later. You can find the map and the notes for this mega dungeon entirely for free in the video description. So if you want to see what random tables could look like, steal a bunch of techniques for yourself, go check that out. That's it for today's video. It's definitely a chunky topic, but I wanted to focus more on giving you some useful tools rather than just do a critique of how things are usually done. Let me know in the comments if you think I've succeeded. Again, I want to thank my first ever sponsor, Burn Bloom's Guide to Freebone Veil. Vale. Go check it out, and if you decide to back it, it's going to help this channel a lot. I also want to thank this channel's members, Michael and Blake Richardson. If you become a member like them, you can get new videos two days early and gain access to a secret channel on Discord where I mostly tell you I'm sorry when it takes me two months to make a video. Thank you for watching, and until next time, have a good one.